Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the latest in the series of BOMS sponsored webinars. Uh, we've got a great program tonight, which uh, my co chairman, Sharif Howard, is going to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, before we do, I'd just like to remind you all of the forthcoming BOMS ASM meeting in Oxford, the training day on the 5th of July and the main meeting on the 6th and the 7th of July. Um, the early bird registration uh, discount finishes on Tuesday. So I just encourage you all to make sure you sign up before Tuesday to get it at the best possible price. And, and particularly if you also signed up as a BOMS member, because there's huge discounts on the registration fees for BOMS members. Uh, the meeting will be going ahead, even if uh, Boris has a little bit of a wobble on the 21st of June. Uh, we actually are confident that we can run a limited meeting with, with uh, some delegates present uh, and the rest of the meeting is a hybrid meeting. Uh, but in the event it is cancelled and your tickets cancelled, you would get a full refund. And we've had good news that the whole meeting, including the training day, is going to give us about 17 CME points as well. Uh, so a really great meeting as always. And the first hopefully face-to-face -face meeting we've all had in 18 months. So please do your best to be there. We'd really look forward to welcoming you in Oxford. I'll hand over to Sharif now. Okay, good evening and uh, sorry for the slight two minute overrun already. So just before we start, uh, I just want to put a plug for our next two events. The first is on the 9th of June, which is the next journal club that will be hosted by the Imperial uh, MDT in London. And the meeting after that, 23rd of June, is the next educational webinar. We have Jamie Kelly, who will be sharing his extensive experience of uh, endoscopic sleeve. So it's everything you wanted to know about the endoscopic sleeve. Uh, but now let's move to tonight. And it, uh, I'm really, really honoured to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Ali Aminian, a world-renowned academic surgeon. Uh, and director of the Bariatric and Metabolic Institute at no less than uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he has a, hu a huge unparalleled publication record in literally the world's best journals, uh, amazing studies, really, really high impact. And he's gonna give us his state-of-the-art update on um, cardiovascular outcomes of metabolic surgery. And the meeting tonight is kindly supported by Medtronic, so we're very grateful for the support. Ali, welcome, and thank you very, very much for supporting the BOMS Educational Programme. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sherry, for the invitation and kind introduction. And thank to you, David, and all the BOMS organizers. So let me see if I can share my screen. So you can see my slides, correct? Okay, so in the next half an hour, I'm gonna briefly talk about cardiovascular outcomes of bariatric or metabolic surgery in patients with type two diabetes and obesity. So this shows the current US status of obesity. And unfortunately, 40% of people in the United States suffer from obesity, 10% 10 10 with severe obesity. And only in the United States, over 100 million people live with diabetes and prediabetes. And you know that these conditions can affect all, almost all organ body systems. And the trend of obesity in the US and everywhere worldwide has not been promising. You see in the past two decades, the, the frequency of obesity in different population has been on rise in white people, African-American, Hispanic, uh, male and female. You see the trend was, uh, was not, not very good. And the, the status of obesity and uh, being overweight is, uh, is uh, getting worse everywhere throughout the world. Currently over 2 billion people, adult people live with obesity or are being overweight. And when you compare the maps, you see that uh, the status is getting worse in every single country around the world. And obesity is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. You see that in this slide, the uh, obesity or abdominal obesity can be as strong as a smoking diabetes and hypertension in predicting the risk of myocardial infarction. And obesity can uh, worsen the effect of the established risk factor of the cardiovascular disease. So the odds ratio of 
uh, having myocardial infarction was about two with smoking in patients with diabetes or hypertension or obesity. But when we have combination of those, you see that the risk of myocardial infarction can increase by 21 times higher, which is significantly higher. Obesity can increase the risk of mortality, uh, cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in both men and women. And we know that obesity has a negative effect on life expectancy. In patients with severe obesity with BMI over 40, uh, there, there is about nine year reduction in life expectancy in men and about eight years in women. We know that obesity can increase the risk of heart failure, stroke, and is associated with different types of cancer, 13 different types of cancer. And the pathophysiology is linked to insulin resistance. So insulin resistance cause uh, uh, diabetes and we have uh, lipid uh, profile, a uh, problem with the lipid profile and hyperinsulinemia, high blood pressure, hypercoagulable state. And these risk factors work together. We have that uh, constellation of risk factors starting with insulin resistance, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and all these can work together and increase risk of cardiovascular disease. So the question is that how bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery or metabolic surgery can help uh, to decrease the risk of cardiovascular outcome. So we know uh, that, uh, you, know, you, you know that we as bariatric surgeons would like to use the term of metabolic surgery, because these are the procedures that influence the metabolism by inducing both weight loss and altering GI physiology. So currently in the United States, 95% of metabolic surgical procedures are either wrong gastric bypass or a slave gastrectomy. And you are aware of these randomized clinical trials. We have, we currently have 12 small randomized clinical trials that consistently show superiority of metabolic surgery in patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity compared with the usual care. So obviously, all of, all of these studies are small studies and they use A1C target as a surrogate marker of diabetes control. They, these are small studies with sample size between 50 to 150 with relatively short follow-up time. So obviously they cannot provide data on the macro or microvascular complications of diabetes, but they consistently show superiority of bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery over usual care for control of diabetes and improvement in HbA1c. I'm gonna briefly review three of those trials that provided five, over five year results. One was the SAMPI trial, which was conducted at the Cleveland Clinic. Briefly, 150 patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity were randomized to three arms, one white gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, and intensive medical management. And five years after randomization, both surgical procedures were superior to the intensive medical management in terms of reduction in HbA1c and weight loss. And the difference between a sleeve and bypass was not significant in terms of diabetes control, but the bypass provided a bit better weight loss effect than the sleeve. Quality of life improved significantly better after surgical procedures compared to the medical management. And again, the difference between the sleeve and bypass was not significant, although the study was not covered to detect the differences between the sleeve and the bypass. Uh, Dr. Mingroni and Dr. Robino recently published their 10 year uh, follow up data of their randomized clinical trial on 60 patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity in Lancet this year. 60 patients were randomized to medical management, gastric bypass, and open BPD. And for, uh, 10 years after randomization, you see that both surgical procedures were superior 
to the medical management in terms of improvement in diabetes and weight loss. And as you see here, uh, initially in the first few years, the PPD was superior uh, to the gastric bypass in terms of, the, in terms of uh, reduction in A1C, but over the course of uh, the years, between five to 10 years, the difference between the BPD and gastric bypass uh, is getting smaller and smaller in terms of diabetes control. And they, uh, they compare the 10-year diabetes-related complications, micro and microvascular complications. They put uh, all the surgical, uh, two surgical groups together uh, versus the medical uh, therapy to increase the power of this uh, particular analysis. And the surgical patients experienced uh, less diabetes related complications at the end of the study compared with the medical group. And this slide shows the quality of life at the end of the study. And uh, you see that both surgical procedures were superior to the medical therapy in terms of improvement in, the, in different aspects of quality of life but gastric bypass uh, uh, patients had better quality of life in certain domains compared with the BPD, including in mental health, physical role, and some vitality uh, aspects of quality of life. So the authors concluded that since both ga gastric bypass and BPD have similar effects in, di in diabetes control and weight loss, uh, since uh, gastric bypass is associated with less post-op complications and better quality of life, at least in certain aspects of quality of life, gastric bypass uh, could be a better option in uh, some patients with diabetes compared with the BPD. And the third randomized clinical trial that provide five-year data for us uh, came from University of Minnesota in uh, United States. Dr. Akram Adin and colleague conducted the diabetes surgery study uh, and they published a five-year data in JAMA. 120 patients were randomized to two arms, gastric bypass and medical management. And as you see here, uh, the results are uh, consistent with the other studies. So, Surgical patients had better A1C, blood pressure control, and lipid control, and they lost more weight. And if we put together the data of all these studies, all these high quality studies together, you see that the odds ratio of achieving main glycemic endpoint of all these, these randomized clinical trials together was eight times uh, greater favoring the bariatric or metabolic surgery compared with the usual care. And the mean difference in the A1C was 1.1% uh, uh, greater or greater reduction in A1C favoring the uh, bariatric or metabolic surgery compared with the usual care. And we know that the anti-diabetes mechanisms of the metabolic surgery is not uh, uh, purely weight loss effect. So the, obviously weight loss is very important. And when we uh, patient lose weight, we're going to see all these good uh, physiologic effects in the body. Uh, we have less hepatic steatosis, and then uh, we're going to have less hepatic glucose output. We have, uh, we're going to see uh, lower, risk, uh, uh, lower risk of lipotoxicity, improvement in the inflammation and lipoapoptosis, and all these can improve the insulin sensitivity and improve the glycemic control. But in addition to these weight loss effects that can happen with any lifestyle or medical or surgical intervention, there are good evidence that weight, in the weight loss independent mechanisms also play a role in uh, seeing uh, these remarkable anti-diabetic effects of metabolic surgery. So the change in bile acid signaling, uh, secretion of the incretin hormones, role of microbiome, all these have been studied. And uh, all these work together 
to improve insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion. And uh, that's why we have this remarkable improvement in glycemic control in patients with type 2 diabetes after metabolic surgery. How about the reduction in mortality? So we have over 30, 35 large observational studies, matched control studies that consistently show survival benefit of metabolic surgery. These are, uh, most of them are very well conducted studies with very large sample size that could show the reduction in mortality or reduction in risk of cardiovascular events after metabolic surgery over a long period of time. Obviously we don't have, we currently we don't have a randomized clinical trial to support that finding, but the findings uh, uh, from these observational studies have been very consistent and the magnitude of the effect was very large. And this can uh, clearly show benefit of bariatric surgery on survival in patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes. And a couple of weeks ago, this important study was published in Lancet and that this meta-analysis pulled together data of 16 of these ob large observational studies, including data of near 200,000 patients over the uh, course of 30 years. And it shows the survival benefit of metabolic surgery. Here you see that uh, this is the, the forest plot of those 16 studies that consistently show, except one study, the, the rest consistently showed significant improvement in survival after metabolic surgery compared with the usual care. And here is the cumulative uh, mortality over the course of 30 years. And this well-conducted large meta-analysis clearly showed near 50% lower risk of death after surgery compared with the usual care. And the median life expectancy that patient gain after surgery in total was about six years, which is a very big deal. In patients with diabetes, surgery provided nine additional year of life. And in patients without diabetes, surgery was associated with five years of additional life. Uh, so uh, five additional life, uh, five additional year. Uh, of life. So that's, that's great. So the effect on patients with diabetes was more prominent, but even in patients without diabetes, patient uh, surgery was associated with survival benefit and reduction in mortality. And they, they uh, estimated the number need to treat to prevent one death in patients with diabetes over the course of 10 years, and it was eight only eight patients. So when we operate on eight patients over the course of one year, over the course of 10 years, we can save one life. And that's, that's remarkable. So, uh, and, and the next few slides, I'm gonna briefly show you our experience at the Cleveland Clinic. And this is a study which was published in JAMA a couple of years ago was part of that uh, meta-analysis that I just showed you. So in this particular study, over 2,000 patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes who underwent bariatric or metabolic surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Health System, their propensity matched 1 to 5 to over 11,000 patients with obesity and diabetes who receive usual care for their, uh, for their problems at the Cleveland Clinic, and we followed them over the course of eight years. Uh, in the surgical patients, in the surgical group, 95% uh, of procedures were either gastric bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy. And you see here, over the course of eight years, the risk of uh, cardiovascular uh, events or major adverse cardiovascular event, which was a composite of six uh, cardiovascular outcomes, was significantly less in patients with uh, in patients after metabolic surgery compared with the usual care with the hazard ratio of 0.61. So that means surgery could decrease the risk of major adverse cardiovascular event by, by 39% or almost 40% in, 
And here is the three component maze, uh, which was dead, MI, and stroke, and surgery was associated with 38% reduction in, in risk of death, stroke, and heart attack over the course of eight years. All cause mortality, and uh, you see here 10% of patients in the surgical arm died over the course of eight years versus almost 18% in the non-surgical control surgery was associated with 41% reduction in risk of mortality, all-cause mortality over the course of eight years. The effect on the heart failure was remarkable. 62% lower risk of heart failure after surgery compared with the uh, usual care. And all of, in all of these graphs, you see that in the first, uh, in the, the uh, close to the time zero, uh, all of them consistently, you see that the risk was higher in the surgical group. And that was because of the post of morbidity and mortality. But over the course of the years, you see all these benefits of the surgery. Which, which, which has been consistently shown in, in all of these uh, observational studies. Effect on the coronary artery disease, the same, 31% reduction in risk of coronary artery disease, 33% reduction in risk of cerebrovascular disease. Effect on nephropathy was, was huge. 60% uh, lower risk of nephropathy in the surgical patients compared with the usual care and atrial fibrillation 22% favoring the surgical uh, group. Surgical patient obviously lost a very large amount of vein compared with the medical group, 15% more weight loss in the surgical patients compared with the usual group, compared with the usual care and the A1C reduction was more prominent in surgical patients, 1.1% greater reduction in the A1C level. Surgical patients require less medications for, to control their diabetes, including insulin. Uh, they need for antihypertensive medications, lipid lowering medications significantly decrease over the years. And then we decided to use this data from this large cohort of patients and uh, apply that for an individual patient because when we see a patient in the clinic, we thought that we need to provide patient objective data about the risk and benefit of bariatric surgery. So it's good to show them and talk to them about the findings of that, those studies, but those studies may not be applicable to one single patient that we see in clinic. So we use the data of this, this large cohort of patients and developed this risk uh, calculator, which can show the 10 year risk of end organ complications of type two diabetes with and without metabolic surgery. And we use different statistical techniques, including the machine learning approach to develop these calculators. So these calculators are available on these two sites, the ASMBS website or riskcalc.org, which, uh, which is Cleveland Clinic website. You can freely get access to these, or you can download the app from the app store, which is called Bariatric Calc. And when you enter patient's data in the calculators, calculator can provide you the risk of and organ complications of diabetes with or without uh, metabolic surgery. So for example, you have a patient who is 62 year old male patient with BMI of 36, African American, never a smoke. This patient had high blood pressure, history of a stroke, nephropathy. You enter the patient's blood pressure, H1, HbA1c, creatinine, and triglyceride into the calculator and the list of medications. So in this patient was on metformin, one antihypertensive medication, and aspirin. When we enter those information into the calculator, the calculator is going to show us the risk of these complications with or without uh, metabolic surgery over the course of 10 years. So this particular patient the risk for this particular patient, the risk of dying over the course of 10 years with this risk, current risk profile will be about 34%.
And if the patient get the surgery, the 10 year risk after surgery can decrease to 21%. So 13% absolute change in 10 year risk of mortality for this single patient. And the relative change in 10 year risk would be around 38%. So we can tell a patient that your 10 year risk of death would be 38% lower after surgery for, diabetes, for your diabetes and obesity. The same for heart failure. So the risk of developing heart failure for this particular patient is about 42% over the course of 10 years. And if the patient get the surgery, that risk can decrease to about 18%. So we can tell patient that we can provide this objective data that your 10 year risk of heart failure would be 58% lower after metabolic surgery. Coronary heart disease, 18% if the patient continue with the usual care versus 14% risk of coronary heart disease in 10 years after surgery, 22% lower risk of coronary heart disease uh, after the surgery. So since this patient already had a stroke and already had nephropathy, the calculator doesn't calculate, it doesn't estimate those risks, but in patients without those uh, end organ complication, the calculator can also estimate uh, those uh, end or risk of those end organ problems of diabetes. And then at the end, the calculator can generate these graphics, which can be more understandable for patients. It can clearly show 10 year outcomes of for 100 people like you, uh, if you get the surgery, what's going to happen and how this risk is going to change after the metabolic surgery. So we briefly discuss about the benefits in the next few slides i'm going to talk about the risk of the metabolic surgery so we as we as bariatric surgeons know uh, uh, very well about the safety of bariatric surgery but uh, probably other medical providers or, or patients don't know about the safety of the metabolic surgery and we need to provide objective data to convince them how safe metabolic surgery is. So this uh, slide, these bar graphs show the national data from the United States of uh, post-op composite complications rate, composite of 15 or 16 post-op complications that can happen in early post-op period for eight procedures, eight different procedures in patients with type 2 diabetes. And as you see here, the composite complication rate of gastric bypass was comparable to hysterectomy and cholecystectomy as and was significantly less than appendectomy, colectomy, knee arthroplasty, and uh, significantly less than the major vascular procedures or cabbage. So it does make sense to do metabolic surgery and improve diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular risk factors and decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease and hopefully patients won't, will not need those morbid cardiovascular operations like vascular procedures or cabbage in future. And here is the risk of death after these procedures over the course of five years. And this is relatively old data. Uh, so we know that the safety of these procedures significantly improve over the time. So gastric bypass risk of death after gastric bypass was comparable to hysterectomy or knee arthroplasty and was less than even appendectomy, cholecystectomy, and significantly less than cabbage or infrainguinal bypass. So the current mortality rate of gastric bypass is about three over in thousand patient. And we know that the sleeve gastrectomy is even safer that the risk is about one in thousand patient. And so uh, let's get back to our patient. So uh, we had objective data to show the efficacy of the bariatric surgery. And we can uh, calculate or estimate the risk of surgery for that particular patient. So there are different calculators uh, in the literature, uh, MBSA QIP provides a good calculator that can calculate or that can estimate the adverse events after different surgical procedures. This particular patient that we just discussed uh, uh, would be a good candidate for a sleeve gastrectomy. As he was a 65-year-old uh, uh, patient with nephropathy and 
history of a stroke with the lower BMI. So the sleeve would be a good choice for that particular patient. And we have a calculator to estimate the risk of a sleeve. And if we put the patient's information into the calculator, the calculator uh, estimate the probability of serious adverse event after the sleeve gastrectomy for this single patient. And that was about 3%. So now, we can provide objective data for the patient. So when we see the patient, we can tell this patient that risk of serious adverse even after sleeve gastrectomy for you gonna be about 3%, and the benefit that you're gonna gain in 10 years would be about 38% low risk of death, 58% low risk of developing heart failure, and 22% low risk of coronary disease. Now you have the option to choose to go with the usual care or to, uh, to consider metabolic surgery or sleep gastrectomy. Again, these calculators are available online. You can get access to those and you can uh, download the bariatric calc and your iPhone and use it freely in your clinic. And I think this is my uh, last slide. Uh, so after having all these remarkable results in the safety and efficacy of metabolic surgery in patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity, now we have the bariatric or metabolic surgery in treatment algorithm of type 2 diabetes, and that's endorsed by over 50 diabetes organizations around the world, including Diabetes UK and uh, American Diabetes Association. So briefly in patient with over BMI of 35, diabetes, uh, diabetes surgery or metabolic surgery should be considered or should be recommended. And in patient with class one obesity, which be, with BMI between 30 to 35, if the patient has poor diabetes control, metabolic surgery should be considered. So the take home message, uh, in patients with obesity and diabetes, metabolic surgery is extremely safe, is extremely effective in achieving weight loss, in reducing the hba C and improving diabetes control, and in reduction in risk of major cardiovascular disease, in improving quality of life, and more importantly, improving the survival and reduction in mortality. So the main goal for each treatment that we provide the, uh, uh, any, 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 in any medical profession is to provide quality of life and to improve survival. And based on the current evidence, metabolic surgery can provide both. It can decrease the risk of mortality significantly cut the risk by half, and it can improve the quality of life in patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes. And the calculators that I showed you pro can provide individualized estimates in risk and benefit of metabolic surgery and can be used to inform treatment decision for patients and practitioners who are considering surgery. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Ali, thank you ever so much for such a comprehensive, comprehensive and balanced and thorough uh, state-of-the-art update uh, on your work. Uh, and just Cleveland Clinic uh, and your team have just made an absolute immense contribution to this field. So uh, thank you to uh, you for all your work uh, and for summarizing that work. Uh, and uh, I had the calculator already uh, on my apps, but I don't use it, but I will use it. Uh, and more importantly, our anaesthetists, uh, now this is my first question to you. So our anaesthetists, um, they often review the highest risk patients that we flag up to them and they use the NSQIP uh, risk score tool. Uh, how, does the, how does your bariatric calculator compare uh, to other risk calculators out there? Have you, have you looked at that? Uh, I mean, I guess yours will be much more specific to bariatric surgery given uh, that you developed it uh, based on your cohort of patients. Uh, thanks, uh, Sharif. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So the point is that, the, the, the first point is that these calculators and these modelings are getting better over the time. 
So obviously the most recent calculators uh, are going to be better than the one that that created 20 years ago. We so historically we have had that obesity that we uh, we had obesity mortality risk calculator. I don't remember the name, but it used five different variables and it was inaccurate. So 10 years ago, that was the only calculator that we have had. Now we have different options. And so each of them has their advantages and disadvantages, but the point is that these are getting better over the time. And hopefully uh, by, uh, uh, by having uh, more uh, clear data, more long-term data, we can generate better calculators that can be used in future. In terms of uh, using bariatric specific or the general calculators, I think or population bariatric surgical patient population is a unique uh, population with a risk specific to that. Uh, anesthesia risk, uh, surgical risk are specific to this population. Uh, I would suggest using the calculators that are specific to patients with severe obesity, not uh, for general, uh, uh, general calculators that can be used uh, for other conditions. I agree, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> That's good. Ali, again, really enjoy this uh, comprehensive kind of tour through the to the literature which you contributed to such a huge amount as well and i actually didn't have the calculator but i have now i've downloaded it during your talk great really brilliant i, I, I love it i love it uh so I, i've got a couple of questions really i just wanted to run by you where one was I, I want to talk about you know some of the new drugs we saw some great results you know in the trials you presented about diabetes remission with surgery but surely you know i'm being provocative here surely the time has come now when we should be using surgery alongside other dr drugs treatments that have come along. And I'm thinking particularly about semaglutide. I mean, Azemkic is a diabetes drug. And now recent papers published this year showing in higher doses uh, that it's actually a really effective weight loss treatment as well. And that combination of that diabetes drug that's also going to produce good weight loss and the bariatric operation, surely is that the future? Is that what we should be doing now? Yeah, thanks, David. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. So... Uh, the important point to consider when, when I show that uh, individualized data or the calculator is that uh, in our cohort, only about 10% of patients were, uh, were on uh, those new diabetes medications like GLP-1 agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors. And 90% of patients were taking those all diabetes medications, metformin and insulin and glipizide and those medications. And we know that in the past few years, we learned that these new diabetes medications, GLP-1 agonists and SGL-2 inhibitors can provide survival benefit, can decrease the risk of mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes. But their effects is small. Their effects in all of these trials that published in New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, they, they, their hazard ratio was about 0 0.9, 0 0.85, 0 0.87. So the risk of more, they can decrease the mortality by 10%, 12%, 15% on that range. The magnitude of effect of metabolic surgery is very large. They, surgery can decrease the risk of mortality between 40 to 50%. This meta-analysis that was published in uh, Lancet a couple of weeks ago, it showed that surgery can decrease the risk of mortality by 50%. 50% is much higher than 10%. So the magnitude of effect that we see after surgery is significantly, significantly higher than the effect that we can see with the new diabetes medications like semaglutide and GLP, other GLP-1 agonists. Uh, but, you know, I mean, so some of the patients probably gonna require diabetes medication after surgery for their residual diabetes. And if that's the case, some patients 
still have diabetes after surgery. Some patients may develop recurrence of their diabetes after surgery. And for these particular patients, probably these new diabetes medication is gonna be a good choice. SGL, SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 agonists. Uh, yeah, I mean, so we, we, we don't have data on uh, how to combine those two different approaches together, but overall, uh, in the past few years, uh, the field of medical management of diabetes uh, uh, was, uh, uh, was great and, uh, and all these new uh, diabetes medication came to market. And uh, because before that, we didn't have any, any medication to provide survival benefit. Now we have these medications that can provide, can provide survival benefit and can decrease the risk of cardiovascular effect. But again, the point is that their benefit is not to the level of uh, bariatric surgery at this point. Great, thanks, Sally. Good answer. Uh, Professor Minin, thank you so much on behalf of all the bariatric surgery residents in the UK. I think your talk and also your papers are fantastic training resources. So thank you for summarising everything for us as well. Um, much has been talked about the weight, the, the weight independent mechanisms of bariatric surgery for improving diabetes remission. But the numbers that you presented for cardiovascular disease like heart failure and AF are fantastic in terms of risk reduction. Is it known how much uh, bariatric surgery um, produces weight independent mechanisms in terms of improving cardiovascular disease or is it mostly all weight dependent or weight loss dependent that is leading to these improvements in cardiovascular disease? That's a, that's a, that's a very good question. No, it's not, on, it's not now how much of that is related to weight loss, how much is related to the other effects of metabolic surgery, but we identified the threshold to see the cardiovascular benefit. So in, we, we found that in patients with uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes who underwent metabolic surgery, if they lose 5 to 10% of their weight, the risk of major adverse cardiovascular even going to decrease. But non-surgical patients needed to lose 20% of their weight to see the same effects. So there is a gap of about 10% uh, between these two group uh, for uh, observing the benefit in cardiovascular effects. So surgical patient required to lose only five, 10% of their weight, non-surgical patient required to lose 20% of their weight to, to observe uh, benefit in cardiovascular, the risk of cardiovascular events. So that indirectly tell us that probably some of the benefit would be related to weight independent effects of the surgery. But we don't know how much, but uh, it seems like the uh, uh, weight independent mechanisms are also involved in uh, uh, cardiovascular benefit because the same uh, the same amount of weight that the patient lose, surgery versus non-surgery, surgical patient gain more benefit. So that may indirectly uh, tell us that uh, independent weight independent mechanisms are also involved. Uh, Ali, thank you so much. We've literally got uh, about a minute left, okay? So just quick question from the audience. Uh, what's your preference, sleeve or bypass? And uh, we've already talked about sort of drug companies developing the drugs, so we won't go into that again. But uh, what, what do you prefer what, um, in your practice or do you just tailor the operation to the patient? Yeah, in my practice for primary procedures, 50-50 sleeve and bypass. And I tailor uh, based on the patient condition and based on severity of diabetes. So the point is that diabetes is only one outcome that we should consider. There are so many outcomes and conditions that we need to consider when we uh, choose or when we decide the best approach for patients. And if you, if you download the calculator uh, from the app store, there is a specific calculator that can help you in decide between a sleeve or bypass for, for treatment of diabetes. But as I said, diabetes is only one outcome. There are many other outcomes and conditions that you need to consider when you, when you choose the most appropriate procedure for your patient. 
Ali, thank you ever so much again on behalf of BOMS Council uh, and our members who've listened in. So this uh, webinar was recorded and it will be made available to all of the BOMS membership so they can uh, tune in and listen to it and learn from your expertise and your talk. So thank you once again. Thank you all for joining us tonight uh, and see you again on the 9th of June. And thank you to the co-chairs uh, and the sponsors Medtronic and to Fran and Matt from uh, EBS for helping us. Good night. Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity. Take care. <laughs>